Ah, thanks for stopping by again. One of the things I found that's interesting in uh, looking at your ancestors is if you ever get into a royal line, uh, it goes back quite a ways. And uh, there's some pretty interesting stories that you might be able to find there. Uh, and that's what I wanted to share with you today, if I could. Um, I was able to tap into one of those royal lines. And so I'm going to tell you just a little bit about my 16th great-grandparents, and that would be James I, King of Scotland, and his wife, Joan Beaufort, Queen of Scots. And uh, their tale is kind of interesting because uh, this actually turns into a bit of a love story. Um, when James I was a young boy, um, things were not too settled in Scotland, and uh, being in line for the throne at age 11, his father decided it would be wise to send him to France uh, to be educated and to be kept safe. And uh, so they put him on a ship, and while he was sailing to France, pirates, yep, they caught him. They took the ship, and actually the pirates took um, James to England, and as a reward, the King of England let the pirates take the ship, and he decided he would keep James. And he put James in the Tower of London. And James actually, I'll jump ahead just a little bit, he spent the next 18 years of his life in the, can we say the care um, in captivity of the King of England. Um, in the Tower of London, uh, he was also allowed, uh, I think it's called Nottingham Castle, uh, where he was allowed to go hunting, and also uh, some time in, I think it's Windsor, is that right? Uh, there's a couple places he was allowed. So it wasn't like he was chained to a wall. Uh, he had a little bit of freedom and was able to go around and actually attend a lot of meetings and learn about the, the duties and functioning of a government and uh, watching the King of England, uh, he became educated, uh, also became a bit of a, a musician and a bit of a poet as well. Now, here's where the story gets interesting. Um, being in the Tower of London, um, uh, da, 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 sorry, um, there was a young lady uh, who was also part of the English court. Um, her name was Joan Beaufort. She was born in the early 1400s, so we're going back quite a ways. Uh, we're talking medieval times here. Um, Joan was the daughter of John Beaufort, the first Earl of Somerset, and she was very well connected. Uh, she was the niece of Henry IV, a great niece of Richard II, and the great granddaughter of Edward III, so she was, she was plugged in. Uh, her uncle, uh, Henry Beaufort, was a cardinal and a chancellor of England. So there's not a lot known about uh, Joan's early life, who is, of course, now my 16th great-grandmother. Um, I guess I've just given it away. They do end up getting married, okay? But um, uh, she was at the court in the early 1420s when James, who was then a prisoner in the Tower of London, first set eyes on her. And uh, James wrote his love for Joan in a very famous poem uh, in England. It's called The King is Queer, which translated is The King's Book. And according to legend, uh, James was at the court of Windsor when he saw Joan for the first time walking her little dog below the Tower of London in the garden. And um, there was a very narrow window that uh, allowed him just a very limited view of uh, the Lady Joan. And she would walk the same route every morning. And James actually wrote a poem, which, uh, of course, as I said, is in the King's Book. Just one second. This is, this is the poem, and this is a line from the poem. I guess it's quite long, but it said, and I, I'll do my best at reading poetry here. It says, Beauty, fair enough to make the world to dote, are ye a worldly creature, or heavenly thing in likeness of nature? Or are ye Cupid's own priesthood, priestess, come here, to loose me out of bonds? And uh, we actually have here, this is a picture, 
that uh, Olivia wrote. Olivia is actually the 18th great-granddaughter of uh, Joan Beaufort and James I of Scotland. And so you see here we have a, a beautiful blue sky with clouds. And in this very tall tower of London, you see James I up here. And he spots down in the garden Joan Beaufort. And actually, Joan, uh, in one of the things I read, Joan does have blonde hair. So she's very beautiful. She's out walking in the garden. James looks down, sees her. And she went for this walk every day at the same time. And uh, one day, uh, James decided he was able to pluck a rose from the garden. And he had it up there. And when he saw Joan walking by, he threw the rose down. And late, later that evening, the story goes, that Joan actually wore that rose pinned to her dress uh, for the evening, the evening dinner. So that was a sign to, uh, to him that she was interested, I guess. And uh, they tried to carry on a, a long-distance romance for some time. And uh, finally, it got to the point where uh, it says that she felt bad for him. And uh, now let's get into the reason why he spent 18 years there. Um, the James' uncle was Robert Stewart. Uh, he was the Duke of Albany, and he was considered to be the guardian of Scotland in James' absence. And uh, he refused to ransom him because he was hoping to gain the throne for himself. Uh, but when Uncle Robert died uh, in 1420, control passed to his son, whose name was Murdoch. Now, Murdoch had been imprisoned by the English for about 12 years, and uh, he was ransomed instead of James, and Scotland fell into a lot of anarchy there. Henry the Fourth, excuse me, Henry V decided it was time for James to return to Scotland after he died, and so uh, it was left to uh, the Duke of Bedford, who was a regent for regent for Henry the Sixth, uh, who was just a little boy at that time. They laid out the terms for James. Uh, ransom and freedom. It was charged at that time, they decided, 60,000 marks. Now, I don't know what that uh, uh, converts to now, uh, to cover the cost of his upkeep and his education for the past 18 years. Um, the agreement also included a, a promise that the Scots would not be involved in the British war with the French and that James would be allowed to marry Lady Joan Beaufort. So James and Joan were married in the Church of St. Mary uh, in Southwark on, in February of 1424. Uh, they were released and they returned to Scotland shortly after that, uh, where he was crowned at the city of Scone by Henry de Worla, who was the Bishop of St. Andrews uh, in 1424. Now, James and Jones had eight children together, seven of which uh, survived their childhood, six of which were daughters. And these six daughters then married throughout Europe to help solidify uh, some of the alliances, uh, which included France, Austria, and the Netherlands. Um, now, upon uh, his return to Scotland, James decided it was time to get revenge uh, on the Duke of Albany's family and all those that followed them. And some were rounded up and executed, and some were actually uh, sent back to England as hostages uh, for payment of the ransom that took place. Uh, James and Joan ruled Scotland for 13 years, and uh, in some of the things I read, even some of the laws that he enacted um, are still talked about today. I won't get into that, but it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, if you look on the internet, you'll find lots of stories about James I and Joan Beaufort there. Uh, Joan actually took a part uh, in ruling uh, some of the, the business of government there, um, but because of some of the laws that he passed, um, he made enemies. And uh, it turns out that due to his long imprisonment in English, England, he decided he wanted to stay away from fortresses and castles. And uh, in February of 1437, he was staying at a place uh, called the Blackfriars, which was a monastery. And uh, as he was getting ready for bed one night, the, the Chamberlain uh, dismissed the guard and removed the locking bar to the king's quarters and let the assassins into the monastery. 
uh, James and Joan were alone with the queen's maids and the queen's ladies when they heard uh, they heard the, the men approaching. Um, on seeing that the locking bar was missing off the door, uh, one of Joan's ladies by the name of Kate Douglas used her own arm to, to barricade the door into the, the, the latch there. Uh, the queen hid the king uh, in an underground vault um, and as the guards, uh, as the assassins pushed the door, actually they broke Kate's arm and uh, the plotters gained entry. Uh, they dragged uh, James from his hiding place and they stabbed him to death. Um, Joan was also wounded in this, in the uh, scuffle, but she actually survived. Um, the plotters, uh, had expected to seize power. That was not to be the case. They were arrested, executed, and they rallied around the new king, who was uh, six years old at the time, by the name of James II. James was buried in Perth, and Joan took an active role in the government uh, for her son. Uh, not wanting to be alone, uh, I guess that was the, the case in those days, she married Sir James Stewart, the Black Knight of Lorne, uh, and essentially, looking ahead, she was eventually arrested, and uh, under the pretext that she would abduct the new king, uh, the new child king, as it were. Uh, Joan and uh, James Stewart were released only on the condition that she would give up custody of James II and that she would leave the court. Uh, they would go on and have three children together, but uh, Joan died at Dunbar Castle in the year 1445, and she was buried also in Perth. So, kind of an interesting story. That uh, that uh, is something I don't think you see a lot in, in those times that a king and a queen were married out of love and not uh, out of some type of a political connection or uh, uh, any type of alliance uh, to gain power. Um, the fact that uh, we do have royal uh, blood, I think, is a kind of an interesting thing. Not that it helps us in any way, but uh, it is interesting to know a little bit about the background and the history there. So thanks for stopping by. We'll talk to you next time.